20 years after it invaded Afghanistan in the aftermath of the September 11, 2001 multiple terrorist attacks on America, the United States is set to withdraw all its troops by the 20th anniversary of those attacks this September 11th. President Joe Biden is scheduled to formally announce the troop withdrawal this afternoon. With that, America intends to end its longest war whose gains have at best been questionable and at worst a staggering failure with over 2,300 US troops killed in Afghanistan and over 20,000 injured, not to mention hundreds of billions of dollars having been spent on the forever war. To understand what the troop withdrawal might mean for the future of Afghanistan, MCR spoke to Anwar Iqbal, the Washington correspondent of Pakistan's Dawn newspaper and one of the most respected observers of Afghanistan who has extensively traveled and reported from that country. Here is Anwar Iqbal. First, give me a broad uh, stroke impression of how you see the deal because you are a a veteran of Afghanistan. What do you think is going to happen now? See, uh, this was expected. First of all, there is a general acceptance of the fact here in Washington, that they cannot stay in Afghanistan forever. And that they that the US presence will at the best keep the status quo. It's not going to improve the situation, but it, it can the, at the best it can keep the status quo. Number two, they, they also had started saying that the Afghan government, that the Afghan forces and Afghan civil society should take responsibility for their country and it's not our job to do their work it's there it is for them to put their country on the right path we can only help and many americans used to complain that okay i mean like we are helping but they're they're not doing anything so there was what what you could may call an engagement fatigue and it is to be expected almost 20 years um and this is the longest ever american involvement in any country so you cannot expect America to stay there forever. That is one thing. The other thing is uh, that uh, despite this re realization, the Americans are either cannot, I think cannot rather they do not, they probably do want to, but they cannot do what is needed, which is to somehow arrange an understanding among Afghanistan's neighbors to promote peace and stability in Afghanistan. Unless that happens, there can never be peace in Afghanistan. Right now, what happens? Pakistan, India, Iran, Uzbekistan, Russia, to some extent even Tajikistan, they all have their proxies in Afghanistan. And they protect their interest by engaging Afghan factions and using them to fight for their interests. For for instance, uh, the Pakistanis feel that if the Indians, or rather whenever the Indians, Indians have interest in Pashtun areas, they start, uh, we start having explosions, we start having armed groups, we start having uh, demands for separation in KP, Khyber Pakhtunkhwa and Balochistan. The Indians feel that whenever Pakistan gets has an upper hand in Afghanistan, uh, particularly in Pashtun areas, but also in non-Pashtun areas, then it uses it to create problems for India. So similarly, Iranians feel that unless and until they protect the Persian speaking and the Shia groups in Iran, they will be vulnerable to happenings in Afghanistan. So they want to make sure that uh, the Persian speakers, particularly the Shias, not only save, but that they maintain a close link with Iran. Remember one thing, a lot of Afghans and Pakistani Shias fought in Syria along with Iran, Iranian volunteer forces okay right. so naturally it is it, it 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 is a major handle of influence for iran which iran uses to its full extent so all these three countries keep 
sort of, in, in a way, I think, consciously or unconsciously, contribute to keeping Afghanistan uh, destabilized. Uh, so unless there is some understanding among, particularly among these three, but also Russia, also Uzbekistan, because uh, Uzbekistan has a lot of influence on Dostum and in northern Afghanistan in Juzjan area, and uh, the, 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 the Uzbek are considered the fiercest fighting force inside Afghanistan, and although they are small, but they uh, occupy a key city, Mazar Sharif, and which is the same, second largest city. So um, having them on board is also important. Right. Tell me something. America never really is known to leave a place once it enters. Uh, it, it, there may be some diminishment in the troop level, but in terms of the American influence in Afghanistan, like it's happened in most places where the U.S. goes to, it's really not going to go away. Uh, they are going to keep 3,000 troops still, right? I don't know. The, the, uh, I mean, keeping troops will not help, you see. Uh, uh, I mean, they can keep some troops if they want. That will only mean uh, having, uh, for, for Taliban and others who are against America, only mean having a target to attack from time to time. It will not achieve much, but American influence will remain. American American influence always stays even after America leaves. Like America left Afghanistan, but America uh, Vietnam, but America still has a lot of influence in influence in Vietnam. Right. Everybody wants America. It's very strange. It's very strange. They want American influence. They want American money. They want Amer the American way of life, but they do not want physical presence. That's it. Right. So I think even Pakistanis, although they are sort of uh, supporting the Taliban demand that the Americans leave, but they actually do not want the Americans to leave. They want some presence in Af uh, American presence in Pakistan, Afghanistan. They want even some troops to stay, and they definitely want the American influence to continue because they, they see that as a balancing factor. The Indians also do not want Americans to leave. Perhaps, I mean, I would say that even the Iranians would not be very happy to see the American leaves because then they would be required to play, uh, to get, to get, to have a deeper involvement in Afghanistan affair than they do now. And that is an, something that mm, the Iranians may not like either. So it's a, it's a very complicated and a very weird situation. Yeah. Uh, one of the conditions, uh of the agreement in 2020 between the U.S. and the Taliban was that the Taliban severed ties with Al-Qaeda permanently. Do you think that, number one, that's feasible? And number two, do you think they will really do that? There is nothing to gain from Al-Qaeda anymore for anyone. Uh, you have also been to Afghanistan and we, because we live in uh, Pakistan and Pakistan has... Uh, more Pashtuns than Afghanistan does, and Karachi is now the largest Afghan uh, uh, Pashtun city in the world. And you know, Karachi is where my family lives, so um, we have been used to living with the Pashtuns, and they are very practical people, very practical and very rational uh, in certain things. I mean, they fight, but they but they do not commit suicide. You see, fight is a, is a perpetual thing. They're there if they're not fighting others, they're fighting among themselves. But they always have a strategy. They, even even fight within families, they will build huge walls. They actually will build bunkers and even bring machine guns and sometimes rocket, uh, propel grenades and all those things to in fight between two families. You see, mm -hmm. and the fight between two tribes is even larger. And fight against, of course, Russia or America is much larger. But you can never blame Pashtuns for not taking all the necessary steps to fight well. Okay, so what will they get out of Al Qaeda now? Nothing. Al Qaeda, the, the Bin Laden family has gone. Al Qaeda has no money. Al Qaeda has no support. Uh, even Muslim governments those who might have been supporting them quietly, even they have withdrawn their support. So there is nothing to be gained from it. So I think having known the Afghan mindset, I, I 
think Taliban will not be reluctant to do away with, uh, with Al-Qaeda. So essentially, the U.S. intelligence assessment that uh, Afghanistan is no longer a sort of an existential uh, threat to the U.S. directly, that's a fair assessment, right? I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is that the Taliban would not want to continue engage with Al-Qaeda. They, they have separated and they will move away from it. As far as uh, using Afghanistan for launching another attack, uh, another 9 9 11 like attack on the United States, I think that's unlikely to happen for many reasons. And the first and foremost is that the, that the Americans are careful now. What happened on 9 11 was unexpected. They will not let that happen. Number two, other countries have seen the consequences. Pakistan has seen the consequences. Afghanistan has seen the consequences of this thing. The Russians have, have the Chinese do not want any trouble. Uh, they do not want. Uh, they definitely do not want really Muslim religious groups to become in, uh, strong in uh, uh, Afghanistan because that will have a direct impact on Xinjiang. So I think uh, that uh, America. I mean, there won't. There will not be another 9/11 like attack. But uh, any country which is as fragmented as Afghanistan, any country which has so many interest groups involved, so many external actors involved, that country will always remain vulnerable for exploitations by all sorts of elements. There has been some return to democracy in Afghanistan. And I was reading a, a story in the New York Times where it quotes ordinary people to say that they are rather worried that once the US umbrella is taken off, they don't know what might happen to the the small roots that democracy has struck there. What's your assessment once the Taliban begins to have a major foothold in governance? What do you think that might do? Mine, look, look at your own statement. I mean, what the Afghans are saying that they, the democracy has started taking foothold, but it will not stay if the Americans leave. So what sort of democracy is that? <laughs> Well, it, that's the dichotomy of Afghanistan. Okay, yeah, that is it. So the problem, we can say that democracy, I don't know. I mean, in a tribal society, as tribal as Afghanistan is, democracy is there in, in, in their own form of democracy. I mean, a tribal society is very democratic where decisions have always been taken in consultations among what they call mashar or the right. elders of the tribe. And that form, of, which, which is which existed in the subcontinent as panchayat, so that democracy is there and is strong and will stay. Western parliamentary democracy uh, will take time. It, it I mean, once it, it, the good thing about democracy is that when you put people on the path of elections and forming political parties, bringing out newspapers, running campaigns, so there. So the process grows its own roots, and it is uh, very difficult to undo it. So that will stay, but will it lead to uh, the type of democracy that we see in the West? That, I think, is it will take a long, long time. That is not going to happen in the near future. But it may not even be necessary once peace prevails. It doesn't matter what form of democracy they practice, right? It, does not necessarily have to be parliamentary in the fashion of, say, in India or Britain or in, in Pakistan or elsewhere. As long as they follow peaceful uh, uh, ways, what difference does it make? No, it's, it is. I mean, for the Afghan middle class, it does. To them, it does make a lot of difference because they want to have a say. And in a tribal setup, the middle class is uh, almost voiceless. You see, uh, true, yeah. always the tribal tribal keys and tribal elders who wield all the power. So obviously, the Afghan mid, for, for the Afghan middle class, it is very important to have a setup in which they have a say. See, we have this problem in Pakistan too. I mean, Pakistan is definitely in this respect better than Afghanistan. But at the same time, compared to India, democracy is weaker in Pakistan because we have very strong tribal traditions in KP, in Balochistan, in Sindh, even in some areas of Punjab. And therefore, democracy, you will, you will uh, I mean, once a long time ago, an Indian uh, journalist asked me why whenever 
an elected government is toppled, why uh, the top, I mean, the change is welcomed in Pakistani cities? Why people take off processions uh, in the streets in favor of the military takeover? Yeah. And I said that is something you need, you need to understand. The thing is, when you have elections, when you have democracy, those who get elected in Pakistan are the ones who are very, very rich and influential. These these are tribal chiefs. These are, these are big jagirdars. These are like, you know, Mm, traditional peace and uh, these are the people that ordinary people have no access to and when the army takes over what do you do what you end up having is army officers the the ordinary people have to deal with they don't have to deal with generals they have to deal with captains and majors at the most a colonel and right. most of these captains and majors and colonels are from lower middle class families who get education get commission and become army officers so what happens when you have a military takeover in pakistan that these middle class people have a greater access to the corridors of power than they do in democracy, and that's why they welcome it. How do you see the exit of the U.S. troops and uh, perhaps Taliban making even deeper inroads? Uh, what do you think it might do to the overall governance structure in Afghanistan? Uh, Afghanistan... I mean, I think Afghanistan needs some sort of setup in Kabul to continue. And uh, the Taliban takeover of Kabul will be a setback. There should be, uh, Taliban should become a part of the ruling elite, but they should not take over. And there should be a consensus, consensus among Afghans to have representation from every segment of the society, every tribal group, every ethnic group. And uh, of course, it will not happen tomorrow, but that should be the ultimate key. They, so uh, the, the danger is that the US withdrawal may cause the collapse of the government in Kabul. Even during, see, during the Soviet invasion or before that, the government in Kabul meant the government in Kabul and some major cities. The federal government or the central government never had much of an influence in the rural areas. So the rural areas were always semi-independent, which, which is how they, they would remain. But, uh, I mean, the Americans and the entire international community, including India and Pakistan, should work to promote uh, a representative setup in Kabul if they want peace and stability in Afghanistan. That is the only option, I think. Right. How do you see India and Pakistan playing out once the US leaves, uh, troops leave uh, Afghanistan? Uh, do you think they'll jostle to have their own spheres of influence or uh, are they in Apparently a position they to work will. together? Apparently they will because they still ha have not been able to even start that talking to each other. Unless they start talking to e each other, they, they cannot really uh, reach an understanding on in anything. I mean, even for an understanding understanding on Afghanistan, they need to talk to each other. They need to be very open that, look, these are our in interests in Afghanistan, and this is what we want. And the other side also has to put its card on the table, and they should then come to an understanding that I don't see that happening in the near future. But a subset of that is the recent promise of a thaw, which never really took place uh, between India and Pakistan. What yeah. do you think happened? Why do you think Imran Khan reversed course on that? See, Pakistan, in that sense, Pakistani society, unfortunately, uh, in, in the Pakistani society, group interests, factional interests, party interests prevail, prevail over national interests. Mm -hmm. So, say, had it be, be PPP or PMLN, they would have done the same thing that Imran did, if they were in, in his, they were in power, because whoever is in power comes to the realization that unless you engage with India, unless you improve relations with India, things will never move. And those who oppose it within within the establishment, within the political setup, in the opposition, everywhere. They also know that this is something that has to be done. But because they see it as uh, an opportunity to attack the government, so people 
um, who disagree, have, have their scores to settle, they also exploit this issue. And, and, and by that, I don't, do not only mean uh, political parties, but pe people within the establishment too. And that is why efforts to improve ties with India never go anywhere. I had asked uh, the former National Security Advisor John Bolton recently whether he thought the Biden administration had leaned on the two countries to uh, begin some sort of negotiation, negotiation, and he said he sees no sign of that. What's your sense of that? I think I think they did. I think they did use the influence. They still are using it, and they want to want India and Pakistan to start talking. Uh, but for that to happen, you see, the Kashmir dispute has also become a major industry in both countries. There, there is a lot of money to be made from it too. You see, and there are interest groups, not just money, but there are interest groups who, who, whose existence is tied to Kashmir. So the, while there are many on both sides would like this to be resolved there are others who do not want it to be resolved so uh, i had hope but it didn't happen that the growth of the middle class particularly in india and, and the influence in the internet the social media and everything will bring up uh, uh, will empower the people who didn't have much of a say in the traditional media or in a traditional political setup and they will have a positive influence on both india and pakistan but that too is not happening yeah those people will probably have become even more uh, sort of anti each other than the traditional political classes were so i don't know for that the thing is we, both sides have this what we call poison in their system and unless this poison is taken out things will not improve. So, so something has to happen for, for, to allow this poison to ooze out of our systems. Right, right. Uh, last couple of questions. One is you mentioned the Afghan middle class. Uh, do you think in the last 20 years of the US presence, it has grown enough to have some say in national affairs? Uh, and uh, if, if the US leaves, what do you think that might do to them? It has grown. I don't know if it is strong enough to have an influence, but it has. I mean, it is much bigger than what it used to be 20 years ago. That is the beauty of, you can say, capital capitalism. That it does create a middle class because it needs to have a middle class for it to right. prosper. So um, if uh, international engagement remains, if money keeps coming in, and if jobs are created, this middle class will grow stronger. Otherwise, what will happen? They will most of them will leave Afghanistan, and things will be back where they were before the U.S. invasion. Right. And finally, uh, what is your expectation of the Taliban making a go for Kabul uh, to control centrally? And if that happens, uh, you already said that may not be a good sign. I think for to do that, the Taliban will need some support from both inside and outside. This time, that support may not be forthcoming because uh, nobody wants Taliban to have total control over Kabul. Including want, Pakistan. If it's true for Pakistan too. Uh, they do not want Taliban to have full control in Kabul. They want Taliban to be a part of the ruling establishment. I mean, they want Taliban to have influence, but they because having Taliban in Afghanistan would have its repercussions on Pakistan too. So True. Pakistan does not want that either. So uh, unless and until uh, there, this, the, say, uh, what do you call the Abdullah Abdullah group and the, uh, the other group, uh, the Pashtuns who are in, in power, uh, President Ashraf, Ashraf Zani's group, they start fighting and, uh, and other, uh, as it happened after the Soviet uh, withdrawal, so if, if they start fighting among each other, all these groups who are in power, then they will make it easier. It will make it easier for the Taliban to come. But uh, if they stay intact, they can get enough support from outside to manage to stay in power.